Thank you for downloading, subscribing, and telling your friends about the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. Coming to you from the fire escape behind the kitchen studios in downtown Raleigh. This episode is sponsored in part by Spot On, tech that helps your business grow. Request a demo at spoton.com. And GigPro. Change the way you find staff with GigPro. Learn more at gigpro.com backslash NCFB. And Joe Van Gogh Coffee, serving the community from seed to cup. It's Max Trujillo and Matthew Weiss. Hey, everybody. This is a special Tuesday bonus edition of the NCFMB podcast. And technically, it's not even really the NCFMB podcast because it's a simulcast of a fantastic podcast called Sound Palette with Kitty Kinnon. Kitty has been a longtime friend of mine ever since I moved to North Carolina back in 2013. Kitty herself is the champagne voice of North Carolina. She's the host of 96.1 BBB on the radio from Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. She's got a great voice. She's a cool person. She's a Raider fan. All cool things in my book. I love Kitty. She's fantastic. And I'm going to help her with her new podcast, Sound Palette. She's got previous guests such as Scott Crawford, Andrew Olam. And so why are we doing this? Well, because Kitty Kinnon interviewed me, yours truly, Max Trujillo, to talk about my new venture, Crafton Food Hall in Nightdale, North Carolina, whose grand opening is this week. We're going to talk about my short-lived music career, the origin story of how Matt and I met and how we created the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, our journey that led us and found ourselves here in North Carolina, and all the little stories in between. We actually sat down a few months back on my birthday, September 29th, and she's been holding on to this in anticipation of Crafton being open. And guess what, folks? We are opening this week. The grand opening is this Friday, February 11th, in Nightdale, address 706 Money Court. And without further ado... Take it away, Kitty. It's nice, Max, to turn the tables on you for a change. <laughs> I love it. It's great. Ask you a few questions. Most excited. We are both rocking our Raiders gear. <laughs> I have my mask on. You know, I do have a thing. I can't wear Raiders gear during the game. Every time I do, the other team scores, and then I take off the hat, and then we score. So really? Like, that's a thing? It's my new thing that yeah. I cannot wear Raiders gear during the game, which sucks, because <laughs> I have more. I look like Al Davis. I've got more yeah. Raiders gear than anybody. Listeners need to know that you are from the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. I'm from San Jose, originally. What is your favorite food memory? As a kid. Oh, wow. Um, Beef stroganoff by my godmother, Jan Samaline. She, God rest her soul now, she would, uh, we would always just go over to her house. My mom was good friends with their family. I love my mom and her cooking and all, but that wasn't her forte. But we would go to Jan's house and Jan, she was of like Norwegian descent or so. She's from Minnesota, but she would make delicious beef stroganoff. And when we knew that she was making it, we were all like excited for the week coming up. Like, oh, Thursday is beef stroganoff over at the Samalines. And so we went there and uh, coupled with her husband, Godfather Marco, owned his own deli. And so I, I spent most of my young childhood in the deli. Was there a lot of cooking going on in your family, in your household? Uh, I was a pretty independent boy. Like I was a latchkey kid. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know that I was, I walked myself home from kindergarten, which is such a weird thing that there's no way like our kids would do that. Were you always creative? Like I know music must have hit you at an early age. When was that? Well, my mom got me on uh, piano classes around that same time, playing piano lessons when I was about five. And I played for a little bit, didn't really jump into it so much. But then I picked up the trumpet in second grade. I played that all through to eighth grade, saxophone somewhere in the middle. But my brother, who is more of the athlete, he would play. He's a lot older than I am. So I would just be in his uh, 79 Trans Am with the T-tops <laughs> off while he had his mullet and and cool mustache. He looked like Burt Reynolds. What were you jamming to? I mean, thinking like good music. It was Elton John. It was Brian Adams. It was Huey Lewis, Journey. It was a lot of good like mm. Bay Area rock and roll. And uh, of course, Sammy Hagar, Van Halen, like a lot of that. And we would just blast 
missed it, headed down to Santa Cruz. Oh, that's a good visual. I can feel it now. And so you were really into music and in a lot of different bands since you were young, correct? Yeah. So I actually was always in in bands. Uh, Once I picked up the guitar around 13, once I got the guitar, it's funny, I'm wearing a Black Crows t-shirt right now. And I saw them on their Shake Shake Your Money Maker tour right now, which was 30 years ago. And 30 years ago, I was... 13. Well, actually, I guess I was 14 now. <laughs> Today, Today's my birthday. But I bought this exact same shirt then, and Black Crows just really exploded in my mind. I'm like, oh, this is what I love. I love mm-hmm. this like Southern Fried Rock. So I picked up the guitar, and I played every day for hours and hours. I will say this. I played the trumpet in my freshman year band, and over the summer when I picked up the guitar in, say, May, I didn't put the guitar down until tryouts for the next year for jazz ensemble and my teacher didn't know I played guitar I just had played for four months and I played all the charts I played everything that we had played the year before but on guitar instead he's like when did you learn I'm like uh it started in May I picked up the guitar very quickly and before long my ego was so big that I thought I was a rock star and I could do whatever (laughs) and I moved to LA to explore both the acting side and the music side of the industry so how and when did the acting bug hit you Max a girl I dated in high school was a big actress and she she thought you could do this you have such a huge personality and you don't you have no fear get on stage so I started doing plays and I was in the who's Tommy it was like a a children's musical production but it was like a really really top-notch production I did uh, Tony and Tina's wedding um, which is you know like an off-Broadway show it's all improv and you played Paul McCartney in some kind of (laughs) Japanese commercial I I heard national commercial in Tokyo uh, (laughs) in Japan to be a Uh, yeah, a beetle. When you moved to LA, you had all of these, uh, you know, passions that you wanted to fulfill. How did that all play out? My roommates and I signed up with Cenex Central Casting Agency as extras, where you got paid thirty five dollars a day to sit, you know, on set, and you're just in the background here and there. I was on the background of movies like Man on the Moon or Bowfinger. I was in She's All That. Uh, wow! Uh, at every TV show, Boy Meets World, Party of Five, Beverly Hills 90210, like all of that, Melrose Place. But I hated that industry. Being there, I realized, oh, the the TV film industry is really, really rough and people are treated poorly. I didn't didn't like it at all. And uh, funny enough, I was applying for a job as a host at Chin Chin on Sunset Strip and a guy overheard me and heard that I I had mentioned Mm -hmm. something about, about being a musician. And he came up to me and said, do you want to be in a band? I need a guitarist. And he was this huge man with an eye patch, 6'7", 275, beautiful Adonis. And he had this great voice, sounded like Teddy Pendergrass. And I said, sure, why not? And I went to a rehearsal. He and I basically formed a band with a lot of other members that, uh, I'll cut the story short, he died in a car accident and was extremely Mm -hmm. terrible. This is about a year and a half into the band. The band somewhat broke up, and many of the members of the band ended up forming the Black Eyed Peas. Oh, wow. You're kidding. Yeah. So I did not get that call. (laughs) You didn't get that gig. Uh, They already had George was the guitarist in the Black Eyed Peas at the time. And so um, our band didn't quite make it. But uh, but a lot of those members did continue on and they, they were rocking it. But I played in a bunch of other bands from that point on. And I imagine you quickly discovered you couldn't really support yourself just playing in a band. So you did what most people do when they go to L.A. You worked in a bar or a restaurant? Yeah, I actually, uh, you know, it's so funny. So today's my birthday, as we mentioned. The first job that I got was on my 21st birthday. I lied about experience. I had been a waiter at, at some places up in Northern California for a little bit. And then I just moved to L.A. I was in Santa Monica. I applied at a Wolfgang Puck Cafe and Monty, the GM, he liked my style. He was like, you're a cool guy, whatever. I want to bring you on as a daytime bartender. How are your chops as a bartender? I'm like, oh, great, man. Blah, blah, blah. I've been doing it for years. I had no idea. I knew nothing. And funny enough, the guy that was the head bartender then, Monty says to me, I want you to meet Dave for a little bit. I think you two are going to get along. Like, Dave goes, you don't know anything about bartending, do you? He sees right through me. And I said, yeah, n- no, I know nothing. He goes, your secret's safe with me because I need a day off. So I'm going to teach you how to be a bartender so that I don't work these crazy hours any longer. Funny enough, Monty said, I think you guys are going to be friends. That guy, Dave, was the best man at my wedding, and he's one of my closest friends today. And you worked there for five years in various capacities. As somewhat of a bar manager, server, we did a ton of the catering events. As most Uh people know, Wolfgang does all the, the Oscar parties and... 
a lot of the world premieres of movies. And so we did a lot of that and that was really fun and got to work right next door to or right ham, you know, side by side with Wolfgang himself because I give him the most props of any chef I've worked around because as big as he is, he is the most grounded chef I know. He still does prep in the morning and he still gets on the line and he, he, he loves being a chef. And I, I love that fact that he still gets to the fundamentals of what he does in the business, even though he's accomplished so much. I think a lot of people try to, they, like, they work a craft so that they don't have to work it any longer. And I'm like, well, but that's your craft. Lord knows if I could have been a rock star, I'd still be playing guitar every day. Right. I still play guitar at home for my girls all the time, like probably more than you would think. I play all the time. And you've got both of them playing too, don't you? Both of them playing. Alexander, who's my oldest, she is jamming on guitar and piano. She can play anything on the piano wow. now. And Charlotte is writing her own songs at eight years old. She's a fellow lefty, so I have all left-handed guitars at home. So she's picking it up. I just plugged in a, a Fender P bass for her and put a little distortion on it and just let her hit that deep E one time. Oh, my God. And she, her eyes lit up. She's like, oh, yeah. Does your gorgeous wifey Felicia play any instruments? Oh, she sings like an angel. Why do I feel like you're being facetious? Like me, I, I would be like in the Wedding Crashers. Something tells me that Felicia has an amazing singing voice, but I'll never know because she'll never do it in front of me. We've been together for 21 years. She has never sung in front of me. So when did you meet Felicia? It was in California, right? It, it was at the aforementioned Wolfgang Puck Cafe. She came in. I was dating this the clientele in, in that regard. <laughs> She she came in in between uh, lunch and dinner and my shift was just about to end. And uh, my, my buddy Dave was coming in to work the night shift and I was just finishing up and I see this beautiful blonde walking in because back then people don't realize even though she's a brunette naturally and is now she was a blonde through almost her entire time living in L.A. that I knew her. And I saw this blonde walk in. I'm like, ooh, who's this? And contrary to what you might think, I actually didn't hit on the guests that came in. I, I kind of felt more like, this is my job. I don't want it to be uncomfortable or whatever. But for some reason, she was just not only attractive, but very friendly. And there was no one in the restaurant. It was just me and her. And I was being very braggadocious, like, oh, I run this place. And <laughs> I was giving her all of this attitude. And uh, before long, I just said, hey, we should go do something. Let me get your uh, let me get your number. And that's the joke is that she didn't just give me her number. She gave me her cell phone, her work phone, her business <laughs> card, her home phone, like all of this. I'm like, oh, this girl wants me to contact her. Yeah. So uh, so I did. And then I called her from a pay phone. Kids, that's what we used before cell phones. Yeah. Uh, at Sonny McLean's bar in uh, on 26th and Wilshire in Santa Monica. And. I ran out of quarters. I had to keep going back to the bar, breaking a five to get more quarters and keep putting it in so we could have our first actual conversation. I ran out of money and the operator said, well, we got to hang up with you. And I'm like, well, I, I, live, please, uh, I just want to say goodbye. You know, that was it. Oh, that's so but, cute. What a visual that is. Seeing yeah. Putting in the quarters, running back, yeah, back, back and, and forth. forth just to have that conversation. You two are so cute. All right. So let's begin your journey with wine. It's funny. I was, uh, I was just leaving Wolfgang to work for Napa Valley Grill, which as you can tell by the name implies that they had a pretty extensive wine program. And one of the servers there gave me grief to say that I didn't know anything about wine. And he was right. I just knew whatever we sold at the time. And he started telling me, you know, this is, you got to learn this, you got to learn this. And I just realized it was so much and it intimidated me. But my buddy who now, uh, Dave, he was now my roommate. Uh, we started just tasting because we thought, you know, this sommelier thing, sommelier thing is kind of a cool one. And I have a pretty good palate. Like just, I think some, some people are born with it or at least can acknowledge it a little bit better than others. And I was able to pull out flavors. And as I'm saying them to Dave, he's like, I don't get that at all. I'm like, you don't get that like mushroom in the background or you don't get that, you know, little forest floor or something. And he's like, no man, it just tastes like berries. I'm like, yeah, okay. And I realized that I could articulate, which is pretty key. And then also just really identify the flavors that are in the, in the wine. And that helped me want to learn more. So cut to years later, uh, being in the restaurant industry, I left the restaurant business as a wine director to become a wine salesman because the wine industry that wanted to, the, the company that wanted to hire me said that they would teach me how to become a sommelier. And they did. Were you very proficient in wine when you worked at Cafe Del Rey? Yeah. So at Cafe Del Rey, I had no real sommelier knowledge. And in fact, while I was the kind of quote unquote bar manager, uh, our general manager, she was let go. And the new manager came in. I introduced myself as the wine director of Cafe Del Rey, which I was not. They did not have one. 
But the best part was <laughs> you're, you're Michael, so brazen. <laughs> Michael, the uh, the new GM, he looked at me and said, uh, oh, "Oh, that's great! I didn't realize we had a wine director here." I, interviewed and they didn't mention that but that's fine because I'm sober and I don't want to run the wine program so that's all you so you and just named yourself wine director I just did that and it's then uh, you know and then it's funny but uh, you know not to cut too far in advance but Matt Weiss who's my partner on the NCFMP podcast he and I worked together then and he knew more about wine than I did at that point but we started doing it together running the wine program together tasting a lot of wine. And that's really how you're going to learn is through repetition and taking copious notes about what you learn. Um, I eventually left to become a, a wine rep and the wine rep, you know, the Southern wine and spirits that I went to work for had a great SOM program. And so they put me on that and I, I figured out a lot of it there and got my, you know, certifications through them. So tell us a little bit more about Matt, who ended up here with you and happens to be your friend, of course, and podcast partner. Yeah. So Matt's a native of, of New York. He, too, was seeking that uh, that performer bug. He wanted, he came out to be an actor and moved to Los Angeles. And so we met. He had been working at other restaurants and been going on auditions and such. But I do think he, just like me, we felt a little disenfranchised or disengaged with the industry. And we found a lot of joy just in the wine program and, and doing beverage. So he was a bartender. Uh, I actually hired him as my replacement when I gave myself the promotion as wine director. Uh, so I, someone had to be the bartender, the head bartender. So Matt came in and did that. And then together, I basically looked at him like, I don't know what I'm doing. And like, I kind of know what I'm doing. I'm like, all right, let's do this. I mean, technically, I think he was more qualified to do the job than I was at that time. But uh, but I had, the, I had the, the position. And so we just worked it together. And, and then he ultimately moved back to New York and he and I remained really close friends and uh, kind of cutting a lot of things out. But when I was living here in Raleigh, he, he was coming down here as well. And I said, you know, man, we're really good at speaking about the industry together and we got to do something. If you're going to live in Raleigh and I'm living in Raleigh, then there's no way we're not working together on a project and being broke. We're like, well, we could do a podcast. I know audio fairly well. When did you move to Raleigh yourself and how did you decide Raleigh? Yeah, I moved in 2013 and uh, my wife and I, we after our first child was born, we thought we don't want to raise our kid in Los Angeles. It just doesn't feel conducive to the, the, the environment that we want. <laughs> and now uh, cut to our, third, our second child was being born and our first child was already three years old. And we're still there. And I went, what are we doing? And so I just yeah. said, that's it. Let's let's change. I took a week off of work at my wine sales job and um, bought a ticket to North Carolina, actually to Charlotte. Leading up to that, Felicia and I, my wife, we did this whole chart of all the places we wanted to live based on economic levels, school systems, uh, closeness to a, a beach or, or so, you know, we wanted to be coastal, yeah. um, but really the economics and the weather had, had a really big things to do with it. We also just wanted to change. So to live another place on the West coast just kind of felt like we were doing the same thing. So we said, let's do it. Let's go to the East coast. And uh, North Carolina just seemed to make the most sense. I think I set up about 13 interviews, one of which was in Raleigh. It was the first one. And, uh, I flew into Charlotte because I knew I'd just dip out to Raleigh and then come back and then continue all the rest of my interviews in Charlotte before I moved or went back on my trip. And that first interview was uh, at Midtown Grill in North Hills, Raleigh. That was your very first. You That's where we be. met. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. And uh, I just I liked the environment. I mean, you know, Midtown is owned by essentially just owned by like two guys. Yeah. Well, uh, Doyle Parish. Yeah, Doyle. And, and, and Doc, as we called him, Dr. Bullock, who at the time owned uh, all the eye care associates. Right. And that guy, he's my spirit animal. He cashed in, sold that business for a hefty amount. And now wow. it just lives the good life, which is great. But during that time, these two guys, they just wanted to run a, a nice restaurant. They didn't want to run it. They wanted somebody to run it for them. Right. I technically, I don't know if I ever told them now and they're hearing it now. I never was a general manager before that time. <laughs> I, you probably implied that you I, were. I said I did. I mean, I was at yeah. AGM and all that yeah. in places and did things. But I'm like, oh, yeah, I could do it. And I could. And I made yeah. a bunch of mistakes here and there doing it. But I ran that place for them for three years. And I loved it. Uh, it was challenging. Of course, at times the hours were insane. And it was an old school restaurant, when you talk about the way things have changed so much, I can relate to all the way the old ways were back then. And, uh, you know, you realize you're like, oh, there's a better way to run restaurants. And that 
old school way is not the way. Give an example of old school. Well, of course, there's the uh, braggadocious amount of hours that you're going to work. And if you cut out at 10 hours that day, your coworkers are like, bro, I'm going to work 12 hours. Or I work. So that's yeah. just stupidity. But then there's also just, you know, there's a lot of heavy drinking on, on <laughs> the jobs. And there's a, there's a lot of things that you say to each other that you probably shouldn't say to each other any longer. And, you know, I, I'm open about this on my own podcast, but it's like, I, look, I, I think it's not okay to have done bad things it's a, it's better to acknowledge that you're trying to get better and then don't do those things any longer. And, you know, bad things. I mean, I'm not like breaking any laws at all, but I'm just saying, you know, we, we were not the best people as a collective yeah. in the restaurant industry. And it's like, it just felt like you're supposed to, or it was okay. And that's just stupid mentality. Now I think, you know, you can look at it more like these are real jobs. You know, I would get mad as a hiring manager when I would interview someone and they would say, well, you know, I'd like to work here um, until I get a real job. And I'd say, hey, I'm the one giving you this job and you're paying your bills. This is a real job. But at the same time, I don't think I was respecting the job as a real job, much like my staff and and, mm -hmm. and the other restaurants in the area. I mean, Midtown stayed open until 2 a.m. every night. And from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., it was all industry folk that came in and had drinks. So I was aware of everything happening, at least in like the North Hills area. And, you know, it was wild. The pandemic had a lot to do. It was like a day of reckoning for a lot of restaurants and a lot of businesses. Those, those that were already failing, they're gone. And unfortunately, but sometimes fortunately, because if you're not putting forth the effort to make your place as good as possible, maybe that's not the business that you should be running. And I think there were a lot of stories that broke sexual misconduct. It was racial misconduct. It was inequities of pay. Why is this, you know, it's the cute girl that gets all the the best sections or the best shifts. And it's the, the, the guy that, uh, you know, the handsome guy who's getting his butt slapped by the manager or whatever, you know, all these things. It's like, this is not okay. This is not mm -hmm. how we're supposed to do things. And I, I feel like we hit a, a point, a breaking point as a society where people have the courage finally to, to step up and say, this isn't what we want in this industry. And it's not okay just because it's the industry which was so many times a, a, a message that was sent like, oh, it's the restaurant industry, get used to it type of mentality, clearly not accepted. All that said, I, I do think that there's a lot, there's so much positivity to be taken out of working in a restaurant industry. And, and it gets browbeaten a lot of times, but let's, let's think, no one forced anybody to be there, mm -hmm. right? Everyone woke up that morning every day and put on their disgusting t-shirt or button-up shirt uh, that they wore th four days in a row before <laughs> and put it back on and took their ugly apron and wine key and pens and went back to work. And so I do have to look at it on both sides. You wanted flexible hours. You wanted to make, if you're a server or a bartender, a ton of money in a very short amount of time, you know, and if you're a, a a line cook that maybe just didn't have a lot of direction and didn't have, you know, what you thought was a skill. And you're like, well, I'm pretty good at being on the grill and my coworkers are fun to be around and all, you know, that, that became a pattern that everybody wanted to be a part of. Yeah. It's not right to put everybody not, in the same box. It's not management's yeah. fault. It's not this one story that broke and it's not, you know, the servers, the bartenders, it's everybody. Everybody was a part of it. And mm -hmm. I think that now we've ripped the bandaid off and said, this is not cool. Now it's everybody's job as well to then create the environment that we want. And so that said, we need to get back to work, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, so you managed a couple of different restaurants after you were at Midtown. I know, what was it, Standard Food afterwards? Yeah, or? I, I, I was there for a very brief stint. Right. I was uh, post-Chef Crawford, who I uh, <laughs> yeah. look up to very much. He's an amazing chef. But he had just left, and uh, they brought in Chef Eric Montagni, who was previous to then working with Vivian Howard at the Boiler Room in Kinston. Sadly, another restaurant that didn't make it through the pandemic. Okay, let's talk about the kitchen. It's your office. It's an interesting creative concept. What you're speaking of, Kitty, is the uh, the kitchen Raleigh is just basically our, our office. It's our home office. And it's in downtown Raleigh in the corner of Fayetteville and Hargett Streets above the CVS. And uh, we are... Uh, a couple of businesses that typically work inside the restaurant industry. So we have a design team. We have my wife's company, who's a photographer in social media management. Food scene. Food scene. 
as in you see it, S E E N. And uh, and the other company I mentioned, MRC, Microsoft Creative. He does graphic design, logo work, brand development, web website, uh, website design. And then I'm, I guess, a little jack of all trades because I do record the podcast, the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast, out of that room. But I also have done a lot of consulting with other businesses while there. Um, we've had an architect that was there that originally started with us. Um, we've then expanded and rented out desks to other people. And uh, and even now, my new business partner, Kip, uh, who's helping create Crafton with me, is working out of that space as well. So it's evolved. It's it's a really beautiful space. Yeah. So Crafton, you're doing the kitchen. You just don't have enough to do. So you're thinking, <laughs> you know, what, what can I do next? Uh, Crafton is a boutique food hall, first of which is opening in Nightdale. And my partner, Kip Downer, he owns the building. And he was already kind of working on doing something there. He, the building that he owns right next door is the, um, is burn Boot Camp, of which he, he runs four of the franchises. And he decided, you know, I got this other space in this building that I, that I own that's not being used. Let's turn it into something. And he had a few food truck operators that were looking to do something there. And he thought, well, maybe I can just do a small food hall here. And uh, lo and behold, I was working on something uh, that I, I won't speak about, but I was actually planning a, a real big, venture a big restaurant kind of concept with multi kitchens and and uh, my wife actually connected me to kip we were at a pool club and sitting there drinking a beer in the shallow end of a pool in the middle of the summer uh last year and we just started kind of comparing notes and realized that the thing that we both really wanted was more uh it was separate from the two things we were actually working on and man i really could use a guy like you and he's like i could really use a guy like you and so um, that was it. We just uh, we decided to kind of walk away from the original ideas that we had and form this new idea. What really kind of makes it different and unique, I should say, is we've all been to a food hall and they're they're great. I love the diversity of being able to eat all these different food items. But the one drag is that you got to stand in different lines all the time. And if we went as a group, you know, my kids might want this and you might want that, and I just want to sit at the bar and do this. Well. I don't want to wait in all those different lines to do all that. So we've consolidated. We have one point of sale system, one POS. And so as the guest, you can walk in, you can order from any of the four kitchens that we have at the Nightdale location, plus the bar and the tab stays open while you were there. So uh, much like a restaurant. And that's what I know most and crafting on top of just being a, a centralized POS system also employs bartenders and servers and cleaning crews and dishwashers so that uh, we take the load off of the work of the kitchens that are renting our spaces, but then we also provide hospitality to the guests when they come in. Simply put, you can sit down at a table, someone will come up to you and take your order. Well, and COVID gave us the opportunity to really explore what digital ordering meant, and we got really good as a society of being used to delivery and, and curbside and hands-free type of ordering. So all of that's still available at Crafton, and you can do as hands-off as possible if, if you'd like, but we also include the human element to it for those that are, feel a little bit more comfortable about coming in and sitting down and, and enjoying a restaurant atmosphere as well. How did you decide on your vendors? So the first set, um, which we have Poblanos Tacos, Fiore Trattoria Pizzeria, the Corner Venezuelan, which does arepas, and Finca Burger were actually good friends of Kip's, and he had them already aligned before he knew me. And so we then kind of worked together. I had this crazy idea of changing the whole system with the POS and the servers. And luckily all four of those vendors were on board. They said, yeah, this sounds great. Mm -hmm. So we did a little mm -hmm. retooling about um, how we built it. And, and there we have it. Each one is in a small community, right? You're doing yes. Nightdale and then you're going to Clayton. Well, that's the whole point of crafting is right. we didn't want to do it in big cities. We literally just wanted to bring that big city mentality, the, the craft cocktails, the variety of food and the multiple ideas of food and maybe not just fast food to the small tertiary markets, if you will. Uh, small towns and just kind of thought like it makes more sense to come to the community rather than having the community come to us and spend all this money on taxis and Ubers and lifts or just, you know, white knuckle it while you're driving back mm -hmm. after a few beers from the downtown location. And that's not a good thing to do either. So the real idea of crafting is in 
multiple locations because it's cool that we have one in Nightdale, but that's not necessarily cool for those that live in Durham or Pittsburgh mm-hmm. or Clayton, as you mentioned. So we thought, well, let's just start opening multiple ones. And because it's a smaller imprint, it's not like, you know, I love going to Transfer Food Hall at the Transfer Co. That place is massive, though. So to like replicate it many, many times over might be a larger challenge. And uh, even just to find all the fantastic food vendors that are in there. And so we're keeping it a little tighter. Uh, Clayton will be a, a touch bigger. It'll be six kitchens as opposed to four. Okay, so who do you have? Can you say who you have for Clayton right now? Or? Uh, I will only say one of the vendors because he already went out and started talking about it on social media. Nick Damp of Damp Good Barbecue. I, I'm saying it weird because that's the way his name is spelled. It's D A M P F. Damp. Born in St. Louis, raised in East Texas. And now here with his family, his wife just gave birth to a beautiful little little girl. And um, he is excited to bring us kind of that wider range of barbecue that so many of our good friends are doing now in this kind of new era of barbecue. Mm-hmm. And so we're excited to bring him along. Uh, I mean, we're, we're putting a massive 2,000-gallon smoker outside the outdoor patio area. It's going to be beautiful. And wow. This is all in Clayton. Not only that, with Clayton, you know, we're I'm doing the full bar program both in Nightdale and and at all the Craftons. We're going to have our own brewery that's coming, but right now we just secured uh, one of our friends that makes beer in the area is helping us make beer for Crafton, and so uh, we will have our own Crafton Lager and Session IPA right when we open. Wow. And well, where did Crafton come from, the name? The name, that's Kip. He basically took the, the word Craft and Kitchen, put it together. The idea was like, let's have Craft Kitchen be the name. But as his IP attorney mentioned, there's nothing you can protect with the two words Craft and Kitchen. I think that you have a song <laughs> in mind because we always have to end with Sound Palette, yeah. where you pair something with any song of your choosing. Yeah, it's so funny. I, I kiddingly almost went with I Love Beer, the uh, <laughs> the good old country tune. But I uh, I thought about it last night, and truly, like it almost gets me um, a little emotional when I think about this song, because I love it so much. And I was explaining to my kids and my wife this morning this very topic right now, and I got all choked up when I talked about it, but uh, this song, I Wish I Was by the Avett Brothers. When you when you hear this song, it's like, for one, just quickly, swiftly, if you're a fan of the Avett Brothers, instantly you think about nothing symbolizes the countryside of North Carolina more than just listening to the Avett Brothers driving down the street. And that's kind of where Crafton fits. It's not a big city concept. It's a, it's, you know, it's, it's in the outskirts of town as well. And I thought, you know, if you listen to the beautiful lyrics that they're singing about, there's like a different imagery. It's almost kind of like a a sexiness in in a sense of whether you're a flame dancing in a candle or you're uh, this tune in rolling in in her, in, in his mouth or a sweater wrapped around your hips. I love all that imagery, but what it makes me think about is like hospitality makes me think of catering to somebody and being a, like a comfort, something that like you didn't realize you needed, but you now absolutely love. And then in the lyrics, there's kind of this self-deprecating mentality of like, and then when you don't want to be a part of this anymore, you can just take me off or you can turn me off and put me out or whatever. And it's just kind of like, I'm here when you need me. And, uh, and, and it, it, I'm an afterthought. But then the song resolves in the fact that he sings it almost more like he has this self-realization of this like sudden realization of confidence in that, wait a minute, I'm not this candle. I'm not this sweater. I'm not these things. I'm a man that loves you. And I'm looking at that in the parallel of Crafton is not just this like, uh, don't think about me twice. It's no, we're here now and we're going to be here. We're going to do intentionally well done things and we're going to be confident about it and we make no apologies about bringing you something awesome that like you didn't expect you were going to have and uh and that's it i like to kind of finish and be bold as hell and be super confident with it while we do it man you almost make me teary-eyed with that how perfect max so this interview with Max took place a few months ago, and there's been some changes. Our Raiders lost, and there's been a lot of progress on craft. And so, Max, you want to update us? First off, Kitty, thank you for having me on the show. It was a blast. And thank you for being such an avid supporter and champion 
for not only my family, but the food and beverage industry here in North Carolina as a whole. To sum it up, Crafton is opening this Friday, February 11th in Nightdale. So follow us at Crafton Food on Instagram and find us on Facebook to keep up with what's going on. And don't forget to subscribe to the North Carolina Food and Beverage Podcast. We're on all major podcast platforms. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the NCFB Podcast. And if you've stuck with us this long, review us on iTunes and remember, five stars are encouraged. Proof Alcohol Ice Cream. We pour art and science into every bite. An artisan ice cream company from Columbia, South Carolina. Proof is changing the way people think about dessert. Triangle Wine Company, locally owned and operated. Triangle Wine Company is committed to creating the best shopping experience in fine wine and craft beers.